Bonsoir, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the second screening of um, Nicolas Pereira's retrospective. Um, as we said already yesterday, it's a great, great pleasure for us to, to screen for the first time the wonderful body of films of, of Nicolas in Brussels, in Belgium. And of course, it's a great pleasure for us to have him here tonight in Brussels. So yesterday, we saw Verano de Goliath, um, and tonight we're going to see the six films of Nicolas, Los Mejores Temas. Um, the, before having Nicolas introduce it, um, I would like to say that um, the screening will be followed by the Q&A um, tonight with a very interesting director, Gus van den Berg, uh, which will be with us. Um, we were very happy when Gus said that he could come because actually you will find, if you know Gus's work, uh, similarities and both director encountered uh, around the same artist, um, Gabino Rodriguez, who's the collaborator of Nicolas in a lot of films. Well, um, so stay for the talk after the film and please um, don't miss the chance to see all of the films of Nicolas. Uh, the retrospective runs until October 21. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Celine, and thanks, Gus, for coming here to do this, and also thank you for coming. Uh, this film is uh, quite, to me at least, very complex film because it's full of different ideas, and so I don't know how to introduce it because I have many things to say, but I really hope you stay at the end uh, for the Q&A. Um, it's a film that... Uh, was a renovating film for me, so I had made five films before this one, and this one I, I tried to... It's called Greatest Hits, not only because it has to do with the film as well, with the content of the film, but to me it was also like a Greatest Hits, like a rock album, Greatest Hits, like, like I compiled all the ideas from the past and I made a film, but then it became something also very new at the same time. Um, anyway, I won't say more, but uh, hopefully you stay here for the... Thank you. <coughs> so, good e first of all, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to thank uh, Nicolas uh, for this movie. Uh, thank you. I think it's uh, for the people that that is the first time they see a film about Nicolas. Uh, Nicolas, I think it's a very good film uh, to start with. <laughs> um, the first time I saw uh, your films was actually in a, in a, a retrospective of your work in 2011 in Munich. And uh, it was there also the first time that I saw uh, Gabino. And uh, I, I met him there. So thank you for that. I, I don't know if you know, but uh, Ghost made a film in Mexico with Gabino, the actress of, of, who's the actor of almost all my films. And uh, anyway. Yes, but he's, he's more. Uh, I think a colleague or a friend, uh, at least that's how I see him, they're an actor. And I think as I uh, know you and know your films, I have the impression that it's the same uh, relationship you have. Um, anyway, uh, I, I saw the questions that, that you uh, got last night, uh, and uh, I'm afraid that they will not be so complicated as mine. Uh, so I will start with a very uh, general uh, question. Uh, I had to smile a lot uh, with this movie uh, as a movie maker uh, because uh, it's very I, I recognize it uh, so much. Um, we work in a, in a structure of, of sporadic uh, families, families that come together uh, as as haven't always been together and then fall apart to make a film and then come together in a different organization. Some of them are the same, some of them changed. And that coming together and uh, going away uh, from families for me was a very uh, a peaceful uh, thought uh, as a filmmaker. Um, so I, I just wanted to know um, uh, how did you uh, came across this movie and how did the bond of these people that you have been working so much during the films uh, came across? Yeah, I mean, it's a very long story because it's meeting all of the people that are involved and then 
I'm, the, the, a big idea of this film was to bring everybody together again, like you say, like a family almost. And so, uh, but it was not just the people, but also the stories and the characters and the relationship between the characters, and also the themes about the other movies. And um, but there was a major change. I mean, the main reason I was making this movie, perhaps not the main reason, but the main story idea that was different than everything else that I'd done, is that in all the films I did before, the, there was a figure of the father who never appears. And then now I wanted to to see what would happen. With, I had four characters that were always there, the mother, the son, the friend, the girlfriend. And now I wanted the father to show up and to change that and it, it, it didn't only change obviously the films and the, the way the film is but it also changed the whole dynamic of of working as well and uh, uh, it became kind of a whole new process again because it's very different to be uh, shooting a film with Gavino and Paco and Luisa in Gavino's apartment than having his biological father there because the first father is Gavino's biological father so it also changes a lot the dynamic uh, while we're shooting but uh, but like you say it has a lot to do with I think there's a uh, in in film history there's many 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 directors who have worked with the same cinematographer and sound designer and crew and then there's a couple directors that work with one actor a lot but uh, I like this idea that when I go to shoot, it's like the same people again, like not just the camera person and the sound guy, but also all the actors and that they already know their characters from the previous film. And there's kind of like a cinematic memory of the characters of, uh, you know, because they, even in, in some of the films that, uh, that they'll show here in the following days or weeks, um, some characters even remember things that happen in other films and they talk about things that happen. So in the films you think it's something that was never filmed and it's just a memory, but then sometimes a memory of some characters is an entire other film. Uh, so anyway, so I'm interested in this thing of, of not just having a collaborative process with the same people, but that the films show this kind of... Uh, you know, greater family. I think it's a beautiful idea uh, that you work uh, in a family, but also that you think in the concept of, of uh, oeuvre, you know, that all your films uh, belong together and there's no distinction uh, between them. Uh, but I have the feeling they're not in a row, but they're more like layers. Uh, did you always have that in mind? Uh, I mean, there are exceptions, and no, I never had that in mind. It was totally, you know, like it's the kind of thing that you don't think about so I make one and then you want to make another one and then and it's always has to do with that you know once one thing is to have a you know when if if someone asks me what's my favorite film that I've made it's always the one I have in my mind that's the one that's gonna be good and that's gonna solve all the problems and it's gonna be you know all this bad stuff is not gonna be there and, and so that's also something you know I make a film and then I see that it's not very good and that I would change everything so in the next one I'm gonna keep all these things that are good but this time I'm gonna get it right and I'm gonna do all these things and then you encounter new problems but uh, it, but it's but I want to keep some things that I do like and so it's a lot more organic so it's not the kind of thing that I think I thought beforehand that I ended up making I don't know seven or eight films with Gavino. You know. mm -hmm. And was there something that when now that you are having retrospectives around the world and that you look at your films as an oeuvre, is there something that, that is coming that, uh, like, uh, that you get to see that you were not aware of? I don't watch them, right? So if I watch them, perhaps... Uh, like, you know, I, and I... I do... Sometimes I do talks where I show clips and things like that, and then I have to invent a narrative or a, I mean perhaps the same for you and I think a lot of filmmakers the way and I was talking a little bit about that yesterday is that the way you think about the films has a lot more to do with a reflection after making them than than you know I, I kind of figure out what my films are about after I make them not beforehand and so the same thing as the, all the, the films as a whole sometimes I 
you know, when I give a talk about the films and I'm preparing clips and things that I'm going to talk about, I, I build a narrative around it and it generally has to do about, you know, how first things were about fiction completely and creating characters and then very quickly I realize that there was a connection between the people in the film that went beyond the characters of the film and there was like a kind of like a documentary world and then because I found that documentary world I started looking at possibilities in documentary but that you know more like the tools of documentary and seeing how I could work with them um, and then obviously there's a big problem about the, the issue of representation and so you know who are the people on the screen which became very important and then for example in this film uh, what was uh, interesting to me in relation to this idea is that it was I had first some initial ideas about problems of representation in my previous film more like the, the one that some of you saw yesterday where you know I'm filming some children from a town and I'm telling them to do some fake interviews for me and stuff like that and then that developed somehow into for example a scene in this movie when when Gavino pretends to be the father and and so you know it's like this hyper fiction so it's you know, who is he representing in that moment? Is it the father that we have been seeing? But there's two fathers, so it's also not clear which one of the fathers he's pretending to be. Anyway, so the, the, the same problems that go from one film to the other start having more possibilities. And so it's also the reason I make so many films has a lot to do with this, that you, you know, there's a film, it opens all kinds of problems, and so you never find solutions, you just find more and more possibilities. And so, and, and those problems, let's say, uh, suggest new films and new, new ways to approach it. And in many ways, that's what's happened to me. You know, I make a film, I experiment with something, that experimentation creates more possibilities. And so I use those possibilities for a new film. And, and that's kind of how it keeps going. Yeah, I think um, what I appreciate a lot is the freedom you have something that you're never aware of when you have it, but you're very free, and I think uh, you uh, approach a film language as something that is alive and vivid. Yeah, not something that I. Uh -huh. I mean, of course, you use the same tools as everybody, but the idea that a language is always permutating, and you have very I, because I do have extremely concrete rules for myself mm -hmm. before I start shooting about from camera angles to to everything else in the film from you know where the microphones are going to be in the distance to the characters but then very quickly as we go because of the the different situations in the film or ideas that happen within the film or because Gavino decides to tell me how about we do it this other way then that starts expanding and then it creates a whole new language even though I start because you have to start with some limits yeah. uh, but then, uh, you know, things always kind of shift. You let go of the rules. Yeah, I mean, to a certain degree, not willingly, you know, like, because, for example, in most of my films, the camera hardly moves, but then once in a while, you see, well, if I pan, it's nicer, you know, like in the beginning, the first shot in this film, you know, Gavino's showering, but then he goes to the, to the mirror, and generally I don't use pans. I don't know why, but there's, you know, sometimes you have rules that, you know, so many rules in the world that are, have no reason for existing, but you just have them. So I never did pans, and then suddenly here, a pan was nice. And so you do it because it works for... Uh, and so, I mean, that's a stupid small example, but like that, you know, it keeps... it, it, it grows. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, before I forget it, if there are questions from the audience, they, they told me that I could uh, say, so there's no microphone, or there is a microphone? Just wave. Uh, so uh, I'm going to continue, and if you have to say something, you can uh, shoot. Talking about freedom, um, I, I know uh, that Gavino always uh, arrives with a lot of uh, luggage, or baggage. He he doesn't come as a person. He comes as with all the stories he's at that moment in, and that's a lot because he also works as a theater maker. He works as a thinker, a political journalist. He works as a activist and as a, a hermit. He, he has this world view that, how do you uh, deal with that? How do you um, approach that or how do you take it with all, everything he gives? I mean, it's, it's, it's a total gift, you know, because it's, 
you call, it's like it's super strange because you call Gavino and you give him a screenplay or an idea or something yeah. and then the next time you meet he arrives with a backpack with like eight books and he puts them here and then like notes and you know and I don't know if you probably did that the same in your film and uh, and then he starts discussing a million ideas that have nothing to do with the film but then perhaps they do and then things start evolving and he suggests things and he uh, and for me it's great because then I feel that I'm not alone that I'm not making this film by myself and then there's a bunch of puppets that are that I have to manipulate but there that there are people that are uh, not just sort of I like the lack of professionalism the fact that it's not that it's a film set in which there are many professionals doing their profession and only their profession and what they're good at but that there is a flexibility in that sense that nobody's a professional everybody's just someone that's trying to make a film and uh, and the roles are not exactly that defined I mean to the degree where like we're like shooting I remember we were shooting a scene in this film and at some point there was a neighbor that had music really loud so it's like uh, I'm thinking so what I'm gonna do so I'm gonna tell someone to change the to, to, to run outside to, to change the music and in that moment Gavino stops everything and says okay we're gonna eat right now and then later we're gonna do this and you're gonna and, and he's that's not his role he's an actor in the film but he just starts telling everybody how to and then suddenly I was like oh that's great I don't have to you know tell people what to do and he generally doesn't do it but he realized that perhaps I was not having a good time with this and that he could solve it so he does it so in some ways in many systems that's very unprofessional thing to do but because there is that flexibility in the shoots and of course that's a you know it's a dumb example but that's kind of how the whole creative process operates but it shows his engagement uh, I think yeah which is nice also that that you work with people that are not just there for the money or just hanging out or whatever could you tell in, in about this film but maybe by the others as well about the the humor in your films I, I think it's it's quite uh, elegant it's never manipulative or, or I think it's rather I always wonder if people are gonna find it funny the things that I think are funny and the things that I think are funny are not necessarily things that I thought were funny when I came up with them so like what I'm trying to say is that when I write things in paper nothing is funny to me even like I don't write jokes and I don't write funny things but then when they become alive with them and they change things uh, then I do find things that are funny but sometimes I think you know how like when you're and going back to this idea of the family if you go to a family dinner and some people do something and then you find it funny but then you if you think about it perhaps anybody outside of that family wouldn't think it's funny it's just because you're part of that group that it's funny so sometimes I think that that is a possibility but uh, so it's hard to say I remember for example very distinctly in this film there was a scene that I had written a more conventional scene which was when Gavino tells when Luisa tells Gavino that she's pregnant, you know, they're like in the, in the convenience store and she says, I'm pregnant. The, what I had written was, she says, I'm pregnant. Gavino is like, oh no, oh my God, what are we going to do? Kind of thing. And then eventually she's like, oh, I was just joking. But I like the fact that, so Gavino read that, didn't say anything, and then we went to shoot it. And he's like, oh, check this out. And so we put the camera and then, you know, she says, uh, you know, I'm pregnant, and he gets so excited, and I was like, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen, but maybe it's because I, he was supposed to do the opposite, but then I do think it's funny, because, you know, it's totally the opposite reaction that you would expect, and so to me that's kind of nice, so, but it's hard to tell to me if it's actually, because it's not a joke, it's something else, it's like a... There's a difference, eh? Yeah. In the joke, and in general, this is, this uh, air of... of funniness or things about gestures that I'm because I'm very interested in the everyday for example there's a scene that was not written but in the moment I asked her to do it because I thought it was nice and funny which is that at the towards the beginning when um, Gavino is still practicing the songs and Teresa sitting uh, uh, next to him waiting he cannot remember and I think music comes on I don't remember if exactly then and she just made him a sandwich 
but he's not yeah. eating and she reaches out and grabs and eats a sandwich I think that's very funny yeah. because he, you know he's supposed to, uh, anyway but maybe it's not but you know what I mean like I don't know if that's funny I just find it funny myself yeah but that's a good beginning I, I would say um, no questions then I continue um, maybe we could talk about uh, the, the combination and I think it's very interesting of, of professional and non-professional actors uh, that's, that's an obvious thing again, but I, th I think it's very interesting how, how that you managed to create a, a pattern that looks like it's, it's authentic. And it's almost, the, the, the strange thing about that is that there is, professional actors are more or less one breed, but non-professional actors come in all kinds of colors. And so in, the, in this film, the two fathers are non-professional actors, but the, the first father is the biological a father, of Gavino, so he's his actual father, and there's a moment where I interview him and I uh, I ask about that's a very confusing moment, but anyway, uh, but he's a he's non-professional, but he's a biological father, so he has a connection to Gavino that's beyond the film, and the second father is is uh, is my uncle, and he's um, more or less like he's you know he's a bit crazy, and so. <laughs> They're, they couldn't be more different, both of them, and they couldn't be more different on screen as well, and and their ideas about acting and being in a film are totally, radically different. And in a way, I, I like... That was a big idea of the film. I mean, all of my films are about the absent father, and I had seen so many, you know, many versions of the son, many versions of the mother, many versions of the girlfriend. And for the first time, I was going to bring the father, and I like the idea that if I'm going to make a film about the father coming back, at least I'll get two shots, you know, I get two fathers in the film so that I have two possibilities of... Because I've, I've worked so many mothers, and now I want to work at least two fathers. And the fact that they're both non-professionals, but, you know, but they approach it uh, so drastically different is nice. And there, there was also something that was curious for me, but also I think it's important for the film, perhaps not, but to me it is, is that because the first father is more like a fictional father, yet he's a biological father. And the second father is like, let's, we could call it the documentary father, but, um, but, it's, but it's not his biological father. And, uh, and, and perhaps there's a combination between the idea of professional actors and non-professional, like there is between fiction and documentary, let's say. Uh, anyway, I, I like the, the, the fact that you, when you're watching it, you're always, not always, but at some point in the film, you're totally unsure of what's going on. In the moment when I ask Gavino to, the Gavino's father to talk about what happened when he, uh, how did he tell him, Gavino, that his, his mother had died? then every, everything in the film starts to break down and you don't know where you're standing. And, uh, and I like that moment of questioning what is happening to the film. It's kind of like disappearing. The, the fiction that was being created suddenly is getting diluted and there is nothing to hold on to. And then suddenly this other guy appears. Yeah. And then the film is alive again, but in a way that is hard to grasp. Was that moment planned or not? The moment when I ask... I mean, they didn't know, but I had planned it, yeah. So, I mean, they didn't know what was happening, but I had thought about this. And uh, to me, it was the opportunity for the film to take a different path after that, and to relationships to become weirder, like who is who, and, and that's after that, Gavino plays the father, and then after Gavino plays the father, a new father comes on, and, you know, and things start getting strange, yeah. Yeah. Uh, why did you edit a film by yourself? Unfortunately, that's a more uh, practical thing. For many years, even while I made this film, I I wanted to, and I don't know why, but I was very stubborn that I was not going to have a job and that I was going to live off my movies. But that also meant that I had to do as many jobs possible. So I would have a budget, let's say, for the films of, I don't know, uh, it varies a lot, but let's say if I had $50,000 to make a film, if I hired people for everything, then I would have very little for myself. It's a stupid answer, but it's the truth. Uh, 
so the more things I did on my own, the more money I got to keep because I could pay myself for it. So if I had hired an editor, I would have like four months less to live, let's say. So in, a, in the ideal scenario, I would work with an editor, but it would have to be, like I, I met an editor who I like a lot and I could work with him, but I could not pay him in this system of, you know, living of my films and, uh, uh, so I, I always hired the least, only the people that I thought I could not make a fi film without. So I, uh, I hire a cinematographer because I, I've shot films myself of other people, but in my own films I feel that it's, I cannot do it. Uh, I, I tried at some point, but it's very hectic and I, you know, I'd rather be with the actors and not with the camera and things like that. But editing, you know, you finish a film, so I have a lot of time to do it. And basically, if I had more money, maybe I would consider it. But uh, and it would be nice. Yeah. I think the films would be better too if I had an editor. But yeah. Yeah. Your shooting technique is with very long takes, with virtually no camera movement. I just wonder why you did that. It comes from when when I made my earlier films, I had this idea that films. There are two two answers. One is that first I had this idea that films in sorry scenes in films should last exactly as much on screen that they last in real life. So I had this concept, and then I did this one shot in, in one of my films that is super long, it's like nine minutes, but I was not looking at the camera while we shot it, I was looking at the actors, and the, it's a scene where the actress goes through many emotions, and while I was looking at her, like not looking at the screen, but looking at the actual actors, it felt like it went way too fast like nobody could go through so many emotions in so little amount of time but i hadn't i didn't look at her watch i didn't know how how much but just by looking at it she was like crying and laughing and being upset and then being and crying again and whatever i felt it was way too fast and then i saw it on a monitor and it was nine minutes and it was took forever and it was like you know uh, you know 10 percent of the film in one shot and it, it seemed uh, so I was very confused and I didn't know what to think about it because then suddenly my ideas of what I was trying to do were not working. But it became like a challenge. So what is the right length in order to imitate life in a way? Or what is, or translate life? It's a strange thing. That was one thing. That, and, and so I felt that if I cut, then I lose that possibility of identification with uh, you know, time in the real world and time in cinema. But then the main thing became later was a, a, a thing about how a cut is necessarily uh, an ellipsis. You know, you cut, and even if you cut on action and you cut within a conversation, there is always a sense that time has been shortened in that cut. And one of the things I like the most about the films have to do with small gestures, which I don't want to emphasize. So let's say, for example, the gesture of Teresa grabbing the, the, the sandwich and eating it. I would never do like a close-up of the sandwich and doing it because then it would be stupid. It would be too obvious. It would be like telling people what to look at and so on. I like the fact that it's there for some people see it, some people won't see it, it's okay. But it's a small gesture. So if I were cutting, it will be very difficult to all those, or when Gavino does things with his hands, or when people scratch, and those things are very difficult to cut too. I need to restrain myself to cutting to those things. I want those two things to appear in the film. And so, uh, because I don't want to indicate where the audience needs to be looking at, I want people to find things, discover things, and discover something and think for the audience, oh, the person next to me probably didn't see that and I saw it and it's fulfilling. I'm pretty sure there's probably other methods to do this, but I find that the long take helps me do those kind of things and you know, have those, those moments. That on the one side, and then 
if you look at the second part of the film where my uncle is very unpredictable and he's talking about things and those things are totally impossible to repeat as well. So it, that in, in those moments of the second part, I, I had to maintain a certain long take because he's not going to repeat the kind of business he wants to propose to Gavino and it's not going to work if I ask him to do it three times from different angles uh, because it's very spontaneous, everything that's happening. So all of those three things that I say, I, that's how I justify having it. It's having said that, I'm getting tired of it and I've thought about this and um, since I started teaching, I, te I don't teach, like I don't tell my students to make films like this. I, we started talking a lot about how to create a space and uh, you know what kind of camera positions you should have and camera movement and so on. And then you know I started looking at film history and how you know, amazing filmmakers have done these kind of things that I refuse to do, and I'm more and more, uh, you know, attracted to that kind of stuff, and I want to do it, I think, at some point. But, uh, you know, like we were saying earlier, a lot of the films, one came after the other, and so the styles are morphing and getting into something else, but that's something that has always stayed in all the films. Um, anyway. And were you influenced at all by Chantal Ackerman? So Sorry. what about Chantal Ackerman? Uh, were you influenced at all by Chantal Ackerman's approach to uh, to directing, yeah. to editing? I totally yeah. forgot we were in Belgium and Chantal Ackerman. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, it's strange because I had I had read about her work, but I had never seen it because it, I don't know. When I was younger, it was not so easy to find her work. So first I wrote, read about her work, and I was very influenced by reading about it. And I think I copied things without having seen the films, and then I saw them, and I was, uh, yeah, I mean, she's incredible. So it's, uh, I think it's very hard to find a filmmaker today who has not been influenced by someone like her and by Bresson, let's say. I've got a question. I'm interested in the way, yes, because yesterday you were talking about the atmosphere or the family that you create, or you also mentioned it when you make a film, um, the people that you work with. And I had a very different feeling about the film today than yesterday, but I was just interested how it differed, the, the, the working with the people. So especially the non-actors, actors relationship, whether for you there was also a difference in the making of the film just comparing these two films? Yeah, I mean, of course, w when you're in the countryside, it's an experience radically different than if you're in a house all day long or in an apartment. And so, it's, it's, it's the whole, everything's different except the fact that I get to see a couple of my friends that I always see, and so there's a similar dynamic with the friendships. But of course, making a film in the countryside involves a whole other kinds of uh, you know, production, and also the amount of time that you spend with each of the people on screen or is a lot more limited. So, for example, when I'm making a scene with the kids in in the film from yesterday, you know, I tell them, you know, I'll pick you up at five and or at three, and by eight I drop you off at your house, and then we do the scene. I drop them off, and if I'm we're not shooting for three days, and I don't see them again or whatever. But in this film. It was everybody come at eight in the morning and everybody leaves at nine at night for the next couple of weeks. And we're all gonna be in the same house and we're gonna make the film there, we're gonna eat there, we're gonna, you know, and if someone wants to stay to sleep, that's your problem, you know, it's a possibility. So obviously, uh, perhaps more than being actors and non-actors, it's just the nature of the film. At the same time, if the film in, in Mexico City, there are people from the city that are from the same social class and uh, that share a lot of things because of the social class. Whereas the film in the countryside is uh, many different social classes, people that live in different places, you know, relate to the world in very different ways. And so obviously the, the type of community that, that builds in both films is drastically different. And perhaps the community of a film like yesterday is when we think about everybody there, it's a lot more of a false community. Like I don't think anybody after the film 
yeah, you know, start calling each other or like visited one another from the town. I mean, I do because it's different. But um, you know, even in this film, even with my uncle, who's you know totally crazy, he still goes to the place that Gavino, Luisa, and Paco make, and uh, yeah, I don't know. If that is The, your interest in representation and all these, um, it felt it feels very clever at times. I mean, but this film it definitely felt I constantly was questioning myself. But in this film, it felt a lot more. Um, I don't know if it's the right word, but somehow yesterday I got really troubled by it, and I was very frustrated and and almost uh, like it felt there was definitely a tearing apart of the different people who were involved and I think you could feel that uh, w exactly what you just described but it was just interesting how um, the, 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 the set I guess of or the setting um, influenced and made me feel comfortable in getting into these these questions that are a lot more conceptual I guess um, but it was interesting things. Continue a little bit. Then <clears throat> I had a question also, maybe to to the interesting contrast. I, did, I wasn't there yesterday to, to watch that film again, but, but in this film, it's interesting how you um, use interiors, even if we're exterior, we're interior. Yeah? Um, and it's then the, the choice of the, the, the interior mm -hmm. shots almost to go to the banal places or the corners, uh, always against the wall or the sofa. Uh, we only see the actors, uh, while well, I know that behind that wall there's probably millions of people passing by in cars and walking. What's the, the, the idea or the reason behind that? So I, I've made many films in Mexico City and almost never you see the city and when I actually shoot in the street you still kind of don't see the city. You just see kind of a wall or, uh, you know, I made a film about movers so you have to see the outside because it's a, they're, in a, they're a moving truck. But uh, even though it's a moving truck, you always see kind of just the truck and not the street or, or just them driving, but not where they're going. And there was something that, you know, I've, I just in general have a, a problem with um, uh, this. Mexico City is obviously very, uh, I don't know what the word is now, uh, uh, alive in a way, but it's also... Um, easy to shoot in many ways because there's always stuff happening and it's very colorful and there's uh, but I wanted to make films in Mexico City where you can tell you're Mexico City but without seeing all that folklore I think that was the word so it's like a very folkloric town because you know you always see like policemen eating tacos in the corner and chatting up some girls and you know everything is kind of like very Mexican, let's say, folkloric and funny, and and I want to be in Mexico City without looking at it, so that I so the films don't become uh, just representations of the city, obvious representations of the city. I want them to be particular individual films, uh, and so so it, it's kind of also very nice always to be interiors, and then it's nice to work in the sound design and think about what kind of sounds we include in order for it to be very clear that we're in the city and not elsewhere. And, you know, it becomes a whole other layer. And then there is that one shot in this film when they go into to the countryside at one point in, in by car yeah. and and they arrive and they have to go back right away. We but we stay inside the car, so it's also an indoor shot even though they're in the countryside. And I like that idea that once I was going to be indoors and it was going to be a claustrophobic film, even when they managed to get out and go to the to the woods or to the lagoon, uh, you're still in a claustrophobic space. No, I remember the stairs very well. It was fantastic. Uh, and is that also why you maybe used that, the, the music you used? So the music in this film is because it's the Goldberg Variations. And because the film is about variations, and I've heard that piece for you know many years, and uh, the structure of the film, I not in a very actual like sitting down and looking at the score and and writing the screenplay, but there is something that the 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 idea of the Goldberg variations of having a theme uh, at the beginning and then having many different variations 
th uh, you know, and all of them referring to the theme and echoing it. You know, it's kind of how the, the film was constructed. So I liked it. I, n I almost never use music in my films, and it was like a very... Uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to do it, and it was going to be strange. Uh, but I don't know if it works, actually. But at least in some moments, I think it's OK. And I felt it was more like a conceptual idea of why I use the music, but then I liked it. Well, it, it starts as a formal choice, but it, it goes towards somewhere else, I think. Uh, why do you use also an old version of the music? Because it's an old recording from records? That's just because I like that version. It's from, yeah, Landowska, who, who recorded this in a very specific clavecin, and I just like how it sounds. Okay. Uh, maybe something totally different, um, but last year I've, I've seen a lot of... Uh, Mexican uh, short film, student films, and low budget um, uh, yeah, feature films or semi feature films. And um, yeah, well, a lot of these, these, these kids really look up to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I, and I also see some traces of your work, so I want, was, was going to wonder like, how do you position yourself uh, in Mexico? And, and have you, do you have a relationship with, with that young uh, generation of filmmakers? Uh, because they're clearly. Um, yeah, uh, uh, or, or looking at your work, what you're doing, and, and or in dialogue with you, let's say. I think it's normal in any country, you know, I mean, we have one director who is really the one director that everybody, in, in the art side of things, let's say, there's a, I don't know if you know Carlos Regadas, who is like the big famous Mexican director, so I think like a lot of students are looking up at, at his work, uh, but I think in some ways my films are uh, easier to imagine that you can make, perhaps, or they're like more accessible in some ways. Uh, accessible is not the right word, but perhaps accessible in terms of production, or I don't know. I mean, I think there's something obviously very, if you're young and you're like 18 and you want to make films, and they tell you, okay, this guy made 10 films and they cost 500 bucks and he makes it with his friends and he does well, then you probably say, oh, you know, that sounds like a good way to go about it. So I think it might have to do with the production as well. And also the fact that they don't look like any other films. Maybe because they're so simple, perhaps. We have a problem in Mexico, actually, that's that we have too much money to make movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then people don't make movies, they just try to gather money. Like, the, the, the job of a Mexican filmmaker now seems to be let's find as much money as possible and then later we think about the film but the main point here is to like stack up the money because we have money from the Mexican government who has put quite a bit of money into into films and then we also have access to all these European funds and you know there's some American funds and so people <coughs> spend years and years just raising funds more than making films uh, which I think is totally problematic, uh, you know, for, from any point of view. And uh, yeah, I don't remember your question, but no, <laughs> <laughs> um, no just I was just wondering how that relationship with, with Mexico was, and that in a way you're also not from Mexico. You you lived or you, in, in Canada, and so you're also all in a way from outside making movies. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Eh? It's the question. <laughs> It's, yeah, I mean, because I, I've lived almost all my uh, adult life, since I was 19, I lived outside of Mexico, so it's, uh, I don't know what kind of films I would be making if I was actually living in Mexico. Also, because I lived outside, I, have, I had kids very young, so I could never leave for a very long time to make films, so I shoot films pretty fast, so also that also changed, I mean, I'm sure if I lived in Mexico and I didn't have a family, Maybe I would spend a month making films like normal people, but I, you know, I shoot films in eight days, ten days, things like that, and so the whole process is very fast, and that changes the dynamics of the films. I also think that that makes the films have a certain energy. I hope that they wouldn't if I took longer, uh, and I'm sure there's things that would be better if I took longer as well. But you know, we are also victims of our circumstances in some ways. So, uh, I, see, I don't see a lot of uh, young Peredas neither. I see a lot of uh, copies. <laughs> well, anyway, there was a question. Yeah, I uh, don't uh, really know what uh, is a Mexican film, but 
would you say that's a, a Mexican film? Um, you show the family, uh, I, I guess, in Mexico City. We don't see um, Mexico City. Uh, we, we see an apartment uh, which could be everywhere. And would you say that Mexican family life, or could it be everywhere? Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, <coughs> and I like the, actually what you say because m one of my 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 problems with this idea of national cinemas is this idea that you're not watching a film but you're watching a culture, let's say. But that only happens, or that mainly happens, with third world films, mostly. Maybe maybe perhaps in Europe, but nobody goes to see an American film to learn about American culture in specific. Perhaps all of American films all together do speak to us about American culture, but uh, you know you don't wa go watch like some superhero movie to learn about you know whatever they do in America. And so I don't make films to talk about Mexico. I make films to talk about people, about human beings. But you know you do do work within a certain context, and I I am interested in how that context I'll, affects the people that you know that, that I'm talking about and so I try to strike a balance so while they're not obvious Mexican films to me there is an aspect that it is very Mexican which has to do with some of the sounds so if you've been in Mexico City you would recognize the guy that sells tamales that has a very specific sound or for example there's a sound that appears like three times but that's, we didn't add that sound, but that was just because it was happening there, of someone that buys uh, and sells um, iron and um, like old fridges and things like that, and so you hear it in the background here and there. That one, and then the job, the specific job of Gavino is also very Mexican. Maybe in other places it happens as well, but this idea of having to memorize a CD with, with names of, of songs, that happens because then people go to the subway and they sell that CD, I mean the idea of it, I think Mexico is very obvious to everybody what Gavino is doing, but I think perhaps outside of it, it's a bit, it seems almost like this is like some kind of conceptual poetry game, but really it's just a very practical, you know, people go into the subway, put up their hands with a CD and start saying names of songs so that if you want to buy the CD, you know what songs are in that CD, so it's a very practical thing, and it does happen, I mean of course I've never seen someone practicing it, and to go back a little bit more to your question, one of the things I liked about not showing Gavino in the subway selling it is that that to me is again like this folkloric thing of just showing like how funny Mexico is. But by extracting that idea and putting it in an apartment, I create a, a, a situation which is totally realistic because these kids that do it have to practice, I'm sure. But at the same time, it's almost like a simulacrum of the actual event. That it's like a practice of the actual event. You never see actual things happening in the film. You just see people practicing actual things. The main thing is the selling of the CD, but they're also just practicing, like when Gavino practices with the mother to kick out the father, or, you know, the a lot of the things in the film have to do with rehearsing and never getting to actually do the thing that you're rehearsing, uh, which, in a way, that's the the definition of what fiction is, because fiction is you, you put something up but then that doesn't really actually materialize in the real world. But anyway, it's a very long way to say that it, it, it is Mexican but it isn't. It's more about people, it's about human beings, it's about mother-son interaction, it could happen anywhere, but if that film I wish to shoot in Canada, I would have had to find a different job for him and a different demeanor for the father perhaps, a different tone, and so then the film will change radically. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I think, um, I'm afraid that this is uh, the last question, but uh, I'm sure that we can continue uh, outside, uh, at least uh, I will. <laughs> um, well, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to receive you uh, in Belgium. I hope it's not the last time. And I want to uh, ask you to give uh, Nicolas a, a warm applause. Thank you. Thank you.